The Man-Eating Tigress of Mandali by Brigadier Reginald George Burton. One of the most amazing encounters with a man-eater was recorded in the Indian Forester for July 1889, where the history of the Tigress of Mandali was related at length. For those who don't know about Indian Forester, it is peer-reviewed scientific journal. This tigress ranged the Jumna Valley, in the neighborhood of Chakrata, a hill station in the Himalayas, frequenting a ridge between that river and the Tuns from 1876 until her death in 1889, haunting the vicinity of a number of villages and taking to man-eating owing to the scarcity of game and the difficulty of hunting and securing wild animals. The ridge was 10,000 feet above the sea, and was covered with snow in winter, when the tigress retired to lower elevations. She had apparently followed the herds from the Dun forests, and had cubs with her, and had been left behind when the herdsmen took their cattle down at the beginning of winter. She began man-eating by killing three men in 1880, when her cubs were destroyed, and as time went on her taste for human flesh increased until she came to prefer man to beast, whether wild or domesticated. On one occasion she walked past a cow and calf and took a man sleeping in the same outhouse. Other men, roused by the noise, got up, and went to the door to see what had happened. The tigress dropped her prey and waited near. She returned when the men had gone back, picked up her victim and made off with him. Then, just as he came to, the other men hearing his groans, at last realizing what had happened, rushed out again only in time to see the tigress disappearing with their comrade down the slope onto the road below. In year 1883, an officer was in camp when an orderly in a small tent by a large fire, being a light sleeper, was awakened at midnight by the tread of a heavy animal galloping down the soft slope just above the tent. He snatched a brand from the fire and shouted, just then the flaps of the tent were suddenly flung open, and he saw the man-eater glaring at him with only the log fire between them. His shout awoke the half-dozen other occupants of the tent, and they made so much noise while he kept flourishing the firebrand across the opening, that the tigress could only stand and glare at them. In two minutes, the whole camp was up, and men with sticks, torches, and anything they could pick up, rushed to the scene. The tigress, enraged, backed some paces, tearing up the earth in her rage, and skulked slowly away to cover close by. On May 7, 1889, a party of forest school students encamped at Mandali. The tigress had a few days previously attempted to carry off one of the shepherds, but had been driven off by his father who struck her on the head with a stick, while a dog seized her by the neck, and she retreated under these assaults, the shepherd only having his back scratched. She had also proved her exceptional boldness by entering a cabin built of large hewn slabs in which 18 men were asleep, and carrying off one of the sleepers without disturbing the others. This animal or another had gone up to one of a group of huts 24 miles into the interior from Mandali, after she had killed and eaten two people. She was accompanied by two young cubs, and pushed open the door, entered the hut, stepped over the first sleeper, and seized the next one by the throat, killing him instantly. On the night of May 11th, the man-eater rushed at a herdsman at Mandali, but he escaped into his hut, and she then chased and killed one of his young cattle at the head of a ravine. In the morning a postman and sis met and shouted at her. Arrangements were made by Mr. Osmaston, a young forest officer, to sit up on a macken or platform for the tigress over the dead bullock that evening, May 12th, but at 2 o'clock a man who was watching the kill came to say that he had heard a heavy animal coming down the ravine. Osmaston, taking a 12-bore rifle, and Hansard, a student, then went after the tigress, one walking on each side of the ravine. The ground was rough, and they could move only very slowly. They had gone about 180 yards when the ground became too rough for walking on Osmaston's side, and he descended to the bottom of the ravine, Hansard walking parallel with him about 30 yards off on the steep slope. Osmaston described what followed, Suddenly I heard a thud, followed by a series of short, snappish, angry growls, and at the same moment I heard groans and cries for help from Hansard, crushed to the ground by the tigress, and struggling, face downward, to get free. The tigress appeared to be tearing his face and neck with her claws. As quickly as I could I leveled the twelve bore at the brute, and, although I was very much afraid of hitting Hansard, I knew it was the poor fellow's last chance. So, I pulled the trigger, and to my relief saw the brute relax her hold and come rolling down the precipitous slope, which ended in a 15-foot drop, nearly sheer. 
The tigress never ceased her hideous growling even to the moment when she fell into the ravine and lay there in the water within a couple of yards of me. I was hemmed in on both sides, so I knew if she was still capable of doing damage it was all up with me. I fired the second barrel into her, and springing down the precipitous ravine, a feat which I don't think I could possibly perform a second time, I rushed up the side of the ravine and made for the place where I had seen Hansard lying, his face all gory and apparently dying. I could not, however, find him, and I rushed back to camp, the direction of which I more or less knew, across several spurs and ravines. Fortunately, the prompt and effective action taken by this young and inexperienced officer, who showed a nerve and promptitude beyond all praise, had finished off the tigress and saved his companion who would have been killed had there been a moment's hesitation. The tigress had sprung on Hansard from behind, bearing him down at once. Happily, all but one of her teeth had been reduced to mere stumps, for she was probably not less and perhaps much more than 17 years old. She could do little more than use her claws, but with time she could even with toothless jaws have crushed his skull to pieces. She clawed his face and back, dislocating the jaw. The only dangerous wound was made by the solitary canine which penetrated behind the ear to the back of the mouth. Fortunately, Osmaston had acted immediately and shot her before she could do further damage. His bullet completely disabled the beast by smashing the spine, raking along under it, and blowing up everything in the way until it stopped in the lungs. A minute after the second shot, Osmaston's orderly, who had been at the Macken build near the dead bullock, hearing his master's cry for help, oh, rushed oh. down the ravine and found the tigress dead and Hansard lying insensible in the water at the bottom of the ravine. After the tigress had let go her hold and rolled down the slope, Hansard, thinking she would come back for him, had crawled down into the ravine, only to find himself within ten yards of his enemy who was of course already dead. It was lucky that the shot against her spine had made the brute relax her hold at once, otherwise, he would have rolled down with her and certainly have been killed by the fall. The tigress was eight feet eight inches in length. Her canines, with one exception, had been worn down to mere stumps. The dead bullock had not a tooth mark on it, its neck was broken, and little flesh was eaten. The tigress was in miserable condition, having been unable to eat a full meal. Hansard suffered for a long time, the wound behind the ear being deep and poisonous, but he eventually recovered.